Hi everybody, this is God Sad. I hope that you're having a good weekend. Uh, I wanted today to spend some time talking about uh, language policing. It's something that I've discussed on countless occasions and later I will quote from an article I wrote back in 2013 on my Psychology Today column regarding the language police. But for now, I want to talk about some of the recent uh, noble attempts to uh, police uh, the words that we use, and for those of you who think, "Oh, come on, this is this is a silly quest. This is not important. This happens in some quack place." Both of these examples come from Stanford University and USC, University of Southern California, so prestigious university. So here we go. The first one is from. So let me read it here for you. Elimination of harmful language uh, initiative. The Elimination of Harmful Language Initiative is a multi-phase, multi-year project to address harmful language in IT at Stanford University. The Elimination of Harmful Language Initiative is one of the actions prioritized in the Statement of Solidarity and Commitment to Action, which was published by the Stanford CIOC Council and the People of Color and Technology Affinity Group in December 2020. The goal of the Elimination of Harmful Language Initiative is to eliminate many forms of harmful language, including racist, violent, and biased, example, disability bias, ethnic bias, ethnic slurs, gender bias, implicit bias, sexual bias, language in Stanford websites and code. The purpose of this website is to educate people about the possible impact of the words we use. Language affects different people in different ways. We are not attempting to assign levels of harm to the terms on this site. We also are not attempting to address all informal uses of language. This website focuses on potentially harmful terms used in the United States, starting with a list of everyday language and terminology. Our suggested alternatives are in line with those by peer institutions and within the technology community. Content warning, because this is now, you know, very, very triggering. This website contains language that is offensive or harmful. Please engage with this website at your own pace. So some of us might be triggered and completely brought to tears by reading words that harm us. Other people go through the Rwanda genocide or the Lebanese civil war as I did. They're all very harmful and triggering. I won't list all the words, but believe me, they're worth you going through every single one. Basically, half the words in the English dictionary are now triggering. I just highlighted a few ones from many different lists, ableist, racist, transphobic, and so on. So let me just do a few. Don't use the word addict so for example if you say somebody is addicted to cocaine some right i can show you papers in scientific journals on the evolution the evolutionary roots of addiction don't use the word addict anymore don't use that that's not a word you should use instead you should use person first language so replace addict by person with a substance use disorder so, for, so the idea that there are words that, because of the evolution of language, it allows us to capture an entire sentence with one word, right? Now we're going the other way. Instead of using the word addict, use one, two, three, four, five, six words to replace addict. So person with a substance is use disorder. Here's another one. When you do a blind review... And in say in a when you send your paper to a to a to a journal and it's blind review meaning now if it's double blind you don't know who the ed, uh, reviewers were and, and the reviewers don't know who the authors were so blind review is is a problem because it unintentionally perpetuates that disability is somehow abnormal or negative furthering an ableist culture right because the default value of human beings is not to see is not they, they haven't evolved this thing called eyesight as one of their five fundamental senses. So if you say blind review, and since the word blind in this case refers to you being blind as to the identity of someone else, but blind could also mean that you can't see and therefore no longer use that, use anonymous review. Because that's really where the biggest challenge is for a person who, who doesn't have the gift of sight 
is not that they don't have the gift of sight, is that you use the word blind. Even in completely different contexts, if you use that word, it perpetuates the marginalizing of people who don't have eyesight. All right, let's move on. This is, by the way, at Stanford. This is not quack. This is Stanford IT. Okay. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Interestingly, I've written a paper in a medical journal on the evolutionary roots of sex-specific symptom, symptom, symptomatology of OCD, right? OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder. Some are obsessions, some are compulsions. And so in the paper in question, I, I talk about how some uh, OCD manifestations occur equally likely across the two sexes. Some are much more likely for men to exhibit. Some are much more likely for women to exhibit. And if we wish to understand that that pattern, then we should turn to evolutionary theory because it's a misfiring of an otherwise adaptive process. Well, it turns out now that in the paper that I had written in that medical journal many years ago where I used the word OCD, that was terribly inappropriate. So a psychiatric condition with a name is itself a form of bigotry. Instead of OCD, you should say detail-oriented. See, so for example, if you suffer from OCD, you say you suffer from detail-orientedness. Even though OCD comes in many, many forms, for example, ruminative thinking is a form of OCD, germ contamination fear is a form of OCD, need for symmetry is a form of OCD. No, 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 replace, no more OCD. That marginalizes people. I'm just going to skip. There are so many amazing ones. Don't use the word brave. The word brave, my God, that guy was so brave. It, it took so much bravery for that fire person to jump into the building. That's not good. Don't use anything. They consider using none or do not use because this term perpetuates the stereotype of the noble, courageous savage equating the indigenous male as being less than man. I'm utterly confused. Right? I mean, when I think of the word brave, I don't think of, I don't know, maybe Atlanta Braves, they're thinking that that's why they have to change the name because it, it relates to indigenous. I don't know. But brave is an adjective. He's brave. She's brave. That required a lot of bravery. It's got nothing to do with racist and indigenous, but apparently it does. Just no longer use that. That concept should be erased because, you know, racism. Don't use the word guru. This guy is a guru of psychiatry. Don't use it because in the Buddhist and Hindu traditions, the word is a sign of respect. Using it casually negates its original value. How so? We borrow from another language to capture a concept. Guru is used in the Hindu and Buddhist tradition. We've usurped that context to use it in the English language. When you take a spelling bee uh, you know, competition and when the, the, the competitors ask for the, you know, they're, they're trying to think of the etymology of the word, they say, what is its language roots? Is it Greek? Is it Latin? Is it German? Is it Hindi? Right? How is that racist? Stanford thinks it is. By the way, don't forget that two months ago, I was at Stanford University uh, speaking at an academic freedom conference. Don't say spirit animal. By the way, I'm skipping through a whole bunch. I just highlighted a few that I thought were you know different. So if you say, you know, the, so for example, I say, activate your inner honey badger. You know, the honey badger is my spirit animal because I'm saying basically that I'm, I'm fierce. I don't back down. If you come after me, I'll come after you. Don't say that because the term refers to an animal spirit that guides and protects one on a journey. So to equate it with an animal one likes is to demean the significance of the term. Don't use that term. Just don't use it. Don't know why, bruh, racism. Don't use tribe. Don't use the term. So for example, when I say to someone, oh, I guess you're part of the tribe, in this case meaning the Jewish tribe, historically used to equate indigenous people with savages. No, it isn't. It's used in many, many different contexts. Okay. 
but apparently don't use it. Use it as, f use other words like friends, network, family, or support system. So for example, if I want to say the Jewish tribe, you're part of the tribe. I shouldn't say that. You're part of the friends. You're part of the network. You're part of the family. You're part of the support system. Don't use tribe because indigenous. Don't, if you approach someone and say, what are your preferred pronouns, which until recently, we know that Jordan Peterson got into trouble for this because, you know, he said he wasn't going to play the, the pronouns game. If you ask someone, what is your, what are your preferred pronouns? That's transphobic. Just say, what are your pronouns? Don't say the word preferred pronouns because the word preferred suggests that non-binary gender identity is a choice and a preference. Right? It's not, it's innate. So if you say, what do you prefer? You are erasing their innateness. And remember, by the way, as I explained, the consuming instinct, uh, heterosexuality is a socially conditioned uh, preference through heteronormativity. So a sexually reproducing species where, where whereby you expect that men would be attracted to women and women to men, that's learned. Homosexuality is innate. So you see the beauty of all of these terms? A sexually reproducing species, the sexually reproducing preference patterns are imposed by social you know, bigotry, heteronormativity. Having sex only with same-sex partners, that's innate. Makes perfect sense. Don't say freshman. You're either a frosh or first year student because it lumps a group of students using masculine language and or into giant binary groups that don't include everyone. Fresh men, fresh women. Don't use things that only apply, only use male language or only presume that there is the male and female phenotypes because we know this is, this is now accepted science. There are 873 genders and many, many sexes. There isn't just two sexes. That's why I have burned all those Darwin books. Darwin's constantly talking male, female. What a effing pig. There's no such thing as male, female. We know this. There are many, many sexes. Don't, don't use he. Don't use he. Don't use she. Don't use seminal. You know, this, this uh, scientist wrote the seminal paper in this field. Very bad. Why? Because this term reinforces male-dominated language. Instead of seminal, say leading or say groundbreaking. Don't say seminal. Okay? Uh, all right, let's keep going. Don't say abort. Right? So, for example, if I say they're going to abort the mission. That's not good. Say cancel or end. Why? Because this term can unintentionally raise religious or moral concerns over abortion. So even though you might be using the verb in a completely non-abortion related context, right? It is time for us to abort our plans, to abort the mission. Don't use that term because it might trigger abortions. And I had a student recently in a class who was very shocked that in discussing the reproductive suppression model, which is a very powerful scientific theory that explains why uh, mammalian species, females of mammalian species, might decide to n not have a child. I mean, not necessarily consciously, but if the environment does not promote for there to be either a pregnancy or if you're already pregnant to then have a miscarriage, the reproductive suppression model says that there are innate evolutionary mechanisms that would then protect you against that. So let's suppose you're a cow and, you know, do you have access to enough calories, grazable land for you to, to eat? And if it turns out that you don't, then, then the cow won't enter into estrus because it makes no sense to become pregnant and then not be able to carry the, 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 the offspring to, to, you know, to, to childbirth. 
or if you're already pregnant as a cow, then there would be a miscarriage. So when I was talking that th about that theory, which I've written about in several books of mine, where I, because I was going to eventually talk about the evolutionary roots of eating disorders as a form of dark side consumption, that student was very, very offended that I was talking about miscarriages. So a real thing, a medical thing that happens where I'm talking about the evolutionary roots of that, that I wouldn't have used trigger warnings and have been more sensitive in broaching that topic, he thought that that was um, quite problematic. So abort, don't use any word that might trigger the concept of abortion. Uh, all right, let's go on. Don't say American. American is offensive. So if you're an American citizen, that's bad. You're a U.S. citizen. Why? Because this term often refers to people from the United States only, thereby insinuating that the U.S. is the most important country in the Americas, which is actually made up of 42 countries. Okay, so don't say American. All right, let's go on. Don't say Hispanic. You're Hispanic? Don't say that. Instead, use, of course, which most Hispanic people use, Latinx, right? So, for example, if you are if you know if you are from a hispanic country you don't say that you say i'm from a latinx country that's that's highly in use so latinx instead of hispanic that's at stanford by the way not a quack thing not minimal so imagine the amount of money that has gone into conducting this multi-year project to come up with this report then you wonder why you pay 75 80 thousand dollars for your child to go to stanford because they're doing the important heavy lifting of trying to cleanse your bigoted mouth. All right, let's go on. Don't say peanut gallery. You know what? I don't want to hear more comments from the peanut gallery. Why is that racist? Well, because this term refers to the cheapest and worst sections in theaters where many black people sat during the vaudeville era, right? So in any way that you can link any term to something bad that's happened somewhere, somehow, erase that word. So pretty much you're left with the words the and a uh as viable words. So anything that you want to say, you should only say the or a. Uh. So for example, if I want to say to my wife, I love you, the word love, but if the Nazis used to use the following words, I love to exterminate Jews. I'm Jewish, by the way, right? So in case you want to send me, you know, I'm offended. The fact that the Nazis used the word, I love exterminating Jews, it's bad to use the word love. So I don't tell my wife, I love you. I just say to her, the, uh. Always I err on the side of caution because I want to be empathetic. I want to be compassionate. Don't say straight. Say heterosexual because straight makes it seem like the good thing is to be straight. The bad thing is it's crooked, right? So it's homosexual. So let me see here what it says. This term implies that anyone who is not heterosexual is bent or not normal. So, okay. Don't say you're a survivor. You're a survivor of the Titanic. You're a survivor of rape. I'm a survivor of the Lebanese Civil War. No. Instead, use person who has experienced rape. That's nicer. Person who has been impacted by rape. You're not a rape survivor. Okay, why? Using first person first language helps to not define people by just one of their experiences. If the person identifies with the term, then, uses, then use it. There you go. Don't say victim. You're a victim of rape? No. You're a person who has experienced rape. You're a person who has been impacted by rape, but you're not a victim of rape. Don't say that. No, no, it's not victim. Except if you're Juicy Smoyer or you're Elizabeth Warren, then you are true victims. Even if the story of victimhood was manufactured, you could use it. So if it's a noble person of color who cries victimhood, then you're a victim. The rest of you assholes don't use the term victim. So I never say I'm a victim of the Lebanese Civil War. I'm a person who has experienced the Lebanese Civil War. Next, don't say black mark. Don't say black sheep. Don't say black bald. Don't say black box. Don't say blacklisted. Don't say brown bag. You know, 
we I used to be by the way the I used to head I was the chair of the brown bag uh, series speaker series at my dep- in my department I didn't know that I was perpetuating linguistic genocide I was the chair of the brown bag series I- I'm being serious that's really true now I know that brown bag is a is a is a linguistic genocide you see how when you become more progressive you can do real important work like here now i'm surprised they didn't add black hole right black hole the cosmological reality of a black hole why black hole why black hole oh because it's scary you go into the black hole and then you disintegrate and you know because of the 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 mass density in a black hole why is it related to black why are you marginalizing black people by calling it black hole? Why don't you call it rainbow hole? Be cosmologically sensitive. Then we got grandfathered. Don't say it was a grandfathered clause. That's just gendered language. We've got, by the way, I'm, I'm skipping a million of these. I mean, literally, if you look at the list, there are, um, there are probably four words that you can use in the English language after Stanford has cleansed the dictionary. Then we got white paper. You know, you uh, consulting group puts together a white paper. Don't say white. White makes it seem like, oh, that's a good thing. White. Again, it's a rainbow paper. Use proper language that makes everybody. I'm a trans person of color. I don't want to see white. That, may, that makes. But if you say it was, you know, McKenzie put out a rainbow color, a rainbow paper, then everybody feels included. If I'm a non-binary person who's transgender and demi-femme, then I feel like I want to read that report. You see how it either excludes me or not? Don't say convict. Don't say convict. A guy has sodomized a bunch of children and killed them, and he's not he's a serial uh, pedophilic killer, and you say he is convict number 1027, you're marginalizing that guy. He's got no future if you're othering him. I mean, sure, he killed a bunch of children, so he's a convict. He's not a convict. Don't say that. Don't say that. He's a person who is or was incarcerated. Using person-first language helps to not define people by just one of their characteristics. So you got this one characteristic. You're a serial recidivist pedophilic killer. That's just one characteristic. But you love dogs. You love sushi. You used to go to the Madonna concerts. You're not just defined by your... pedophilic serial killing so don't call the person convict you define him by that one thing that he does where he rapes and kills children that's not right we want to build a better world where people fear feel included not excluded by the way literally everything that i'm saying it, it might sound as though i'm using the the sad the satire, sad, S-A-A-D, satire, but I'm literally aping what happens every day at universities. This all starts at universities. You really need to be me in universities. All right, let's go on. Homeless person, don't say homeless. Don't say homeless. So a person who's without a home home and therefore homeless, right? For example, you're childless, right? You're rudderless. Don't say that. Remove all words that have less because that's othering. It removes, right? Person without housing. You're not homeless. You're a person without housing. Okay, that's much more. Why again? Because it's using person first language. This is at Stanford. This is the hard work being done at Stanford, Stanford, Stanford University, one of the top universities in the entire world, not quackery, not some esoteric thing, at Stanford IT. Don't say you come from an abusive relationship. You are in a relationship with an abusive person, okay? The relationship doesn't commit abuse, so don't say it's an abusive relationship, you know, speak properly. Oh, you know, I killed it during that game. Don't say that. Don't say killed it. You did a great job. You're doing a great job. Why? Because doing a good job should not be equated with death. The term could also be triggering if someone close to the recipient actually was killed. So for example, if you say, I killed it, 
And anybody listens to that who's had anybody who's died in their lives, including a pet, then that could be triggering. So don't use any words that trigger the concept of death. Don't use anything. Okay. All right. Pull the trigger. You know, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and, and start my business. I'm going to pull the trigger. Don't say that because that unnecessarily uses violent imagery to encourage another person to do something. Pull the trigger. That's the MAGA extremist, the Second Amendment nut jobs pulling the trigger, right? It's the National Rifle Association. Don't use that term anymore. It relates to guns. Take a shot at it. Don't say that. You know what? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up to that girl. Uh, you know, I'm going to muster up all my courage and go up to her. Uh, that's not good because taking a shot, again, triggers violence. Take a shot. You take a shot with a gun. Don't say that. Tr don't use trigger warning as a term for trigger warnings. That itself could be true. Now we are entering into a nested orgiastic language policing. So when it used to be use trigger warnings and the word trigger warning to warn someone, don't use trigger warning because these terms, let me see, the phrase can cause stress about what's to follow. So, so don't, for example, don't say pregnancy. There should be a trigger warning before you use the word pregnancy because what if I am someone who could never be pregnant, okay? But now using trigger warning as a term for trigger warning is bad. Instead, why don't you use content note? But, it, but what about if we now learn that content note means that something triggering is gonna happen, then the next version of this thing will be don't use content note because that's triggering. Therefore, any word that you use that might serve as a warning should then be erased. So all we should do is just stand and stare because any utterance that comes out of our mouth could be triggering to someone. Be sensitive, shut your mouth forever. Don't use war room. You know, we're gonna gather in the war room and decide how we're gonna run that study. Don't use that, that uses now, I went through the Lebanese Civil War. It's almost impossible to think of anyone who's gone through a more violent past than the first year that we went through in the Lebanese Civil War as Lebanese Jews in Lebanon. But I, in the past, I'd never been triggered by the, the term war room, even though I went through the most brutal war imaginable, house to house killing and executions and eradication of people in entire neighborhoods. Okay, but apparently... For some reason, I wasn't triggered by war room. I should have been. Let's go on. Don't use the term African-American. Use black. Now, remember very recently, it became the opposite. Don't say black to describe a person. Describe them using their origin. They're African-American. Even if they didn't come from Africa. Even though, you know, Elon Musk is African-American. He's from South Africa. Now we've reverted back. It used to be don't say black, use African-American. Now it is don't say African-American, say black. I wish this were my satire. It isn't. I did warn you for many years now. Don't say hip, hip, hooray. Why? Because this term was used by German citizens during the Holocaust as a rallying cry when they would hunt down Jewish citizens living in segregated neighborhoods. I'm Jewish. I never knew that. So if you say... One, two, three, hip, hip, hooray. You are perpetuating the Holocaust. And I hate it that I'm Jewish and I was part of the, the Holocaust because I'm sure I've, used, I've heard the term hip, hip, hooray and never reacted to it adversely. Don't use it. Don't say you're going to submit your assignment. You're going to submit your paper for peer review. Why? Because depending on the context, this term can imply allowing others to have power over you, right? You're you're submitting to you to the person's demands. So you're in a submissive role. Don't say that. Say process. Don't use the the term submit should be eradicated. Is there anything else? I think I'm done here. So that's that's the Stanford one. Let's go on. Here we've got USC Susan Dworak Peck School of Social Work. Uh, the other one was from December. By the way, the Stanford one got so much flack that they then took it down and they're learning. It's a teachable moment. We're, we're reconvening. They use all the, the work terms only because people got so offended 
by such stupidity. And again, remember, there is a whole cadre, or as the Americans say, cadre, but the word in French is cadre. There's a whole cadre of people who get paid a lot of money, more money than the fanciest of professors, to do these things, administrators, to create more diverse and inclusive language at the university and so on. So that was Stanford. Now we're going to go on to USC. So here is USC. Let me read you their their uh, paper, their letter. So this is to all people at, the, at that school of social work, including the community, the faculty, staff, and students. This is a practicum education department, department name change. As we enter 2023, we would like to share a change we are making at the Susan Dwork Peck School of Social Work to ensure our use of inclusive language and practice. Specifically, we have decided to remove the term, quote, field from our curriculum and practice and replace it with the word, quote, practicum. So whenever, instead of using the word field, right, I'm doing field work, you're doing a practicum, okay? This change supports, absolutely, it supports anti-racist social work practiced practice by replacing language that can be considered anti-black or anti-immigrant in favor of inclusive language. I'm very interested to see now how field, the word field, for example, you know, uh, I'm, in, I'm a specialist in the field of evolutionary psychology. I'm a specialist in the field of psychology of decision making. That's racist. That's anti-black. Let's see how uh, it should be used. Language can be powerful and phrases such as going into the field or field work may have connotations for descendants of slavery and immigrant workers that are not benign. This change aligns with the Council on Social Work Education advancing anti-racism and social work education through educational accreditation policies and standards, the 2021 National Association of Social Work's commitment to undoing racism through social work and the Eliminate Racism Grant Challenge for Social Work. Imagine how much removing the word field is going to eradicate racism. I mean, I'd be surprised after this change if there were one racist incident anywhere in the world, if we get rid of the word field, you're pretty much guaranteed that there'll be no more bigotry. So it just, it shocks me that we didn't come to this conclusion earlier. Imagine if the Nazis had eradicated the word field before they implemented the final solution on the, on the Jews. My goodness. What, what if sliding doors in solidarity with universities across the nation, our goal is not just to change language, but to honor and acknowledge inclusion and reject white supremacy, anti-immigration, anti-immigrant, and anti-blackness ideologies. What better way to get rid of white supremacy, anti-blackness, and so on than to get rid of the word field? They're doing impactful social work at USC. Words are powerful, but even more so is action. They're taking action. They're getting rid of the word field. They're not just some, some esoteric bullshitters who collectively have the IQ of my toe. No, they're taking anti-racist action at USC. We are committing to further align our actions, behaviors, and practices with anti-racism and anti-oppression, which requires taking a close and critical look at our profession, our history, our biases, and our complicity in past and current injustices. It also means continuing to work together to train social work students today who understand and embody social and racial justice. This is the bedrock of our values and principles, and we all need to hold each other accountable to do better in this regard. We know that changing terminology can be challenging and a complete transition will take some time, but we thank you in advance for joining us in this effort and for your patience as we transition. Now, that way, by the way, as we transition strikes me as a bit bigoted in a transphobic way because people transition from one sex to another, from one gender to another. And for them to use it in this context is clearly uh, minimizing the hurt feelings of transgender people. If you have any questions or comment, please contact us as sswpracticum at usc.edu. So there you go. So that's uh, USC. So both, as you can see, USC and uh, Stanford are doing the important work of taking action. Now, I wrote an article back in uh, December 30th, 2013, so 10 years ago now, 
almost 10 years ago, on the follies of the politically correct language police. Uh, I'll put a link to it in the description of the of this uh, video. But here, let me just read a, a little quote. I don't, I don't wish to imply that language is an innocuous mode of communication. Of course, humans have used language since time immemorial to inflict injury and pain on one another. However, while it is incumbent on all decent people to do their best to avoid hurting one another, these politically correct language initiatives are misguided and harmful. They create highly entitled professional quote, victims who expect to be free from any offense and they engender a stifling atmosphere where all individuals walk on eggshells lest they might commit a linguistic crime, capital crime, unbeknownst to them in the great majority of instance. It is not, quote, dehumanizing to call someone an illegal immigrant if she resides if he or she resides in the host country illegally. There is nothing offensive about the word obese. It is a descriptor of a person's weight. Given the current meaning of African American, white South Africans, and olive-skinned Algerians who are naturalized Americans cannot be called African American even though they originate from Africa. But now, as you see, Stanford said, don't call black people African American, call them black. The linguistic idiocy is endless. Of all possible ways that someone might work to make the world a better place, it is difficult to imagine a less worthy endeavor than engaging an endless and somewhat random linguistic samba. Is it offensive to use the term samba here? I wrote this almost 10 years ago. I've been warning you for almost three decades. And then I sit back in the back of the room with my hands crossed, and then I'm the guy that tells you, I told you so. Get engaged, participate in the battle of ideas, and please consider supporting this channel in any way that you can. Have a good day, everybody.